Thank you so much. I brought along a little prop. We love to do show and tell in our, in our classes. And this is an amazing 3D printed, low cost, autonomous underwater vehicle built by uh, uh, MIT Woods Hole Joint Program grad student Ray Teresi. And I'll say a little bit more about this at the end. And I'm going to put that guy down. And so my research, my technical superpower, superpower is spatial artificial intelligence. So um, I want robots to effectively have, and people, to have Google for the physical world. Imagine being able to know who and what is where in the world and, and as a function of time. I want to create robots that are long-lived, that move around the world and teach themselves about the world. And uh, they can, the sort of fundamental question is, where am I and, and what's around me? And so we, my research group is uh, about a dozen MIT students and postdocs. We've, we've, done, we've worked with dozens of robots over the years. I came to MIT in 1991 to build small, low-cost underwater vehicles. And we, we work on robot navigation algorithms that can apply in many different environments, but especially in the underwater realm. Uh, the scuba diver picture here is actually one of my students, Jesse Pelletier, who graduated a couple years ago during training at, uh, at Woods Hole. We, we came up with the idea of having an underwater vehicle that could help a scuba diver to navigate, and that's one of our works in progress. And um, so imagine a robot tasked with exploring an unknown environment as it moves around. GPS doesn't work underwater, of course, so it's trying to answer the question, where am I? Where, where is everything around me? And then what is everything around, around me? And that adding the what part, like adding kind of labels and identities to objects, that's actually one of the leaps forward in the field of robot navigation over the last few years. And the general problem of how robots navigate around an unknown environment, collecting data, building maps, using that for, for path planning, it has many applications. We want many, many of these vehicles to, to go and monitor the ocean and make measurements. Uh, we, the ocean is vastly undersampled, extremely important for security, for applications like aquaculture. And the same algorithms also apply to self-driving cars, to, to household robots. And so we try to, we're trying to basically formulate how robots can uh, use their experience to understand the world by processing their sensor data. So this slide is a math, and I apologize, but it's basically just the sort of problem formulation of what we call semantic simultaneous localization and mapping is how a robot tries to concurrently identify things in the world while also locating them and moving. And it's just a big optimization problem with lots and lots of data. And so in my career, I, I joke that I'm still working on my PhD thesis that I started in 1987, which is how a robot can build a map, use the map to navigate. And there are these challenges. There's this kind of multidimensional space where there have been now hundreds of PhD theses around the world on this problem. Uh, and one of the core questions is representation. How do you represent the environment? And over the, over the years, there have been many different kinds of representations. And modern machine learning tools and computation from GPUs are enabling some really uh, awesome new representational techniques that I'll show towards the end. And once you choose a representation, then you have a very challenging inference problem. How do, how do you sort of combine all the data uh, and, and, and kind of fuse it together? But as a roboticist, it's not enough just to kind of make maps. Or we, we want to actually close the loop and create systems and deploy them, make them autonomous. And especially for the ocean, it's very easy to lose your robot. It's hard to communicate with your robot. And that's one of the drivers to create more robust algorithms for mapping and localization. So uh, we have a new kind of superpower in our lab, which is uh, and, and in kind of a taking advantage of all the tr tremendous advances in object rec recognition. Um, we're moving towards newer representations where we can represent the world in terms of objects. So this is a, a student who finished his PhD last summer walking around the lab just a few hundred meters from here and, and Stata. And using it runs in real time, detecting objects, which has sort of a now become a standard technology. But the new piece for us, uh, and it's a little hard to explain all the details of what's going on here, but um, when you first see an object with just a monocular camera, you just know a ray along which it's located. And that's why we have these sort of particles that, that you can see, which are um, these. Um, uh, but once you get multiple looks at an object, you can, you can get a better estimate of where it is. And then we use an ellipsoid to represent the uncertainty. And so as the, as the person walking around goes back to the start, 
One of the most important capabilities in robot navigation we call loop closing. Loop closing is, has anyone wandered around the MIT campus and come back to where you started through a completely different path? That sort of embodies a lot of the challenges uh, in robot navigation. So, um, but we're also trying to do this underwater. And underwater, it's obviously very hard to, to uh, vision is challenging due to turbidity and lighting. Uh, and this is some of my current students, Jung Siok and JP, where we put uh, a tethered underwater vehicle that we use as a test bed in the MIT Z Center pool. And this is sort of very preliminary results of taking some of the same algorithms. And for the underwater vehicle, we also have a sonar. And so underwater, we're using a sonar sensor to get the range to initialize an object, machine learning detectors to try to detect new objects we've not seen before, and then we, we stitch it all together in something we call a pose graph, which is sort of like a Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail of where the robots traveled. And as the robot gets more and more data, it, it, um, it uh, tries to kind of build up an understanding of the world that would let it then go uh, manipulate or, or do something else with the objects. And so we're also working in the Charles River. We have a lab there, and we, and we collaborate with folks uh, that go to more difficult, far off places around the world. And uh, this is an example of a kind of map that the robots made of identifying these objects, going back and forth. Uh, and we take camera data, we identify objects, we take sonar data, we try to compute and combine it together. So that's sort of some object-based mapping in underwater. I also want to give you a little glimpse into some newer work uh, with uh, some other collaborators. Uh, well, first, uh, for the underwater side, I'm going to show you my prop. So this is a vehicle called Sea Scout. Um, has a really cool toroidal propeller here. And the, uh, this, this grad student, Ray, and it's a sort of a fork of a design by some guys named Supan and Mike in the Sea Grant Lab, where I started back in 1991. And, and what's amazing today, 3D printing really is a superpower. As a mechanical engineering professor, it's just been so uh, amazing to see what our students are building and doing uh, with this technology. And so we're currently teaching a freshman class where a different kind of a cousin of this vehicle, we're building 10 vehicles. Students, freshmen, are, are helping build and assemble and test in the river uh, their own vehicles. And uh, the, the, one of the research challenges is how multiple vehicles can cooperatively navigate. Now, this vehicle has a, a sonar altimeter sensor on it, so it can measure its height off the bottom. It has a pressure sensor, an inertial sensor, just like what Debbie talked about, an onboard computer, onboard batteries. We have another student uh, working on an acoustic modem module, which would make this vehicle a bit longer, and it would be able to communicate underwater acoustically. So we have to communicate sort of like the way dolphins and whales do, by using sound, because light does not propagate well underwater. So I'm going to put this down so I don't break Ray's beautiful propeller. And so that's some of our work with the underwater side. Completely different context. Uh, some of the things that are unfolding in Machine learning and computer vision are truly amazing. And so with collaborators, uh, Gu Yang, Ran Choi, who's here, Professor Philip Azola, here are some examples of something called NERFs, neural radiance fields. And this is from last summer, flying a drone around Stata on a day when the weather was much better. And the key thing is to create a compact neural representation that lets you create novel views. So this is not a replay of where the drone flew. This is the drone flew around, it made a model, and then you can do novel view synthesis where you can go places that the drone didn't fly. And so uh, there's just this amazing level of detail that can be created with these models. Folks talk about digital twins where you sort of create virtual copies of the world. So that's an example outside with Stata. Here's an example of a, a different technique called Gaussian splatting. We snuck this in at the end here. This was just this a little surprise for John. This was done right before the event started today. And so this is, uh, you can see the TEDxMIT. Uh, and so thanks to Ron for doing this. And, um, and uh, these, these, I like to go outside the representations. They remind me of like the Harry Potter kind of things where you, you kind of go the dream sequence. It's, it's kind of like, and here's another example. This is from an event we did last summer in the same room. So this is this room set up for a different event. Uh, and this is back to the neural radiance field, which is a higher kind of resolution, but has some, all the different techniques have sort of trade-offs in how they handle uncertainty and so forth. And one last example, this is outside the building on a nice sunny day. And, and 
I'm just sort of amazed by the level of quality of the reconstruction of the bicycles. It's not really a reconstruction, it's your ability to visualize the bicycles. So kind of what, what's happening in the computer vision community is just amazing. And as a roboticist, I'm hungry for ways to capture models of the world and then use those for robots to do useful things to help people. And as a summary, our goal um, is to create tools to enable the physically embodied uh, intelligence, it's kind of spatial AI. And my dream is robots that can build and maintain models of the world through lifelong learning, improving their performance over time, and helping humans to perform difficult tasks. And philosophically, I am a strong believer in amplifying rather than replacing human capabilities. I have a parallel life where I'm an advisor at Toyota Research Institute. We're working on ways to make people safer drivers by taking the powers of AI to make people better drivers through coaching, teaching, advanced safety systems. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of business plans where the goal is completely eliminate the human and keep everything the same. I think it's through augmenting human capabilities, adding those superpowers, but keeping the human in charge, keeping the human element, that that's, that's where we should go as a society. So I want to say thank you uh, and thanks some collaborators. <laughs>